and we are live. Welcome everyone to a new episode of Electric Podcast, uh, an episode on Wednesday. We know we know it's Wednesday. We did it Wednesday. Uh, Seth and I, by the way, Seth is with me. How are you, Seth? I'm good. Great. And uh, we liked it last week that it was on Wednesday, so we figured, like, well, let's 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 try to do it on Wednesday instead. Um, then on all, the end of the week, when we were both a little bit tired, and um, just before leaving for the weekend, so so we'll we'll try out at least for now on Wednesday. See how it goes. See how it feels, and um, we'll adjust if there's need to. But for the meantime, we still we, instead we did it last Wednesday. We had a full week of news, or at least sort of because there was a long weekend where there's not as much news as usual but uh elon kept us busy earlier this week with a bunch of things i also uh went out on a road trip this weekend in a tesla model 3 which i did a, a post about and uh we can discuss that a little bit because it was quite eventful uh the road trip itself and my whole weekend but that's probably another story um Let's start out with something strange that Elon said. Then he corrected it, but it's still, it's still, I think, an important news either way. It's that that at first it sounded like he said, "Oh no, sorry, I put another article first. That I think uh, because we mentioned it last week that I was going to update you on that. Let, let's start with that real quick because I just posted that um, about the goal to Tesla. Of course, last week posted their overall delivery number, ninety-five thousand vehicle." great result record quarter and everything but we were tracking deliveries in north america for the last month because tesla was counting on the north american mar market to reach the global delivery record because of course um as sales in north america are easier at the end of the quarter because uh, tesla doesn't have to put a vehicle in transit for a long period of time to ship them to china and europe and so on also and also the federal, on the federal tax credit yeah, last quarter since it was being half again, that was that definitely had a huge impact. Um, so they were aiming for thirty-three thousand units, which in a single month for North American market, it's extremely difficult to do. And to encourage employees to do it, they uh, offered bonuses last month, twelve twelve hundred dollars for uh, sales employees, every sales employees, if they reach a twenty-three thousand mark, thirty-three thousand. And for the first time, they also offered bonuses for delivery employees because deliveries appear to be the bottleneck, the, the logistical problem of getting the cars to consumers uh, in, in all the different markets was was uh, going to be the issue here. And they offered a $550 bonus for, for all those employees. And of course, first time those employees were getting bonuses, so um, they were happy about that. And it did light a fire underneath them. And uh keep in mind that those employees especially the sales employees here they got their compensation cut significantly earlier this year in the whole sales online thing tesla remove all commission uh, which was a significant part of the compensation for many employees so those bonuses were were gonna help them a lot to compensate for for the uh, reduction in their salaries uh, over the, since the beginning of the year uh, now we learned that Tesla told employees that they were 200 units short of that 33,000 goal. And um, they didn't outright say that they're not getting bonuses, but they, they stopped mentioning it. It's not it's not in their cards anymore. And employees, are, I'm told by uh, several sources, that uh, they're not expecting them anymore. Which is uh, kind of disappointing because there's no way around it that they did an incredible job. <laughs> Almost thirty-three thousand vehicles delivered last month. It's incredible, and from what I'm understanding, like they were working nonstop, incredible hours to make this happen. I went myself to a Tesla store during the the peak of the delivery rush uh, during the last week of uh, uh, June, and people were they would all the staff was it was all hands on deck uh, delivering cars at high pace, and um, yeah. Investors made a lot of money from Tesla reaching their, their overall goal. So to set an ambitious, maybe overly ambitious goal of 33,000 units just for North American market, and then have it cut short of by just 100 units and not getting out the bonuses, uh, that seems like uh, not the right thing to do uh, in my book. I'm still uh, hoping that Tesla changes this and uh, actually ends out the bonuses, or at least partial ones. The very least yeah they, but, they, could, they could prorate the bonus 
bonus and pretty easily. Exactly. That's the easy math, right? It's not yep. that field to do. And it's not that big. I mean, I don't know how many sales and delivery employees there are exactly in North America, but I mean, it's it's not it's not a tens of thousands. I mean, it wouldn't be that big of a check to write. Like it would have an impact, of course, on Tesla uh as financials but not that big of one and i think the impact on the morale of the morale of the employees it would be bigger than, than the cost of ending out those bonuses and i have to say i'm not happy about the feedback on that news oh really? it's <laughs> it's quite disappointing from tesla fans that are like hey hey they didn't get they didn't reach a goal they didn't reach a goal tesla should not have to pay like, yes but is it the right thing to do? Like those employees are all people that, that are passionate about the Tesla's mission. They work extremely hard. Elon is often like very publicly, at least, very appreciative of the employees. Like uh, that, that was all on good, good job from the Tesla team and whatnot. I think that appreciation should also be represented in their financial uh, compensation for the employees. I mean, I think it's just fair, especially when you you take into account the fact that they just got their salary slash earlier this year uh while tesla wasn't a cash crunch tesla is not in a cash crunch anymore they raised a billion dollar they just had an amazing quarter thanks to the employees and also of course that Tesla customers and whatnot but in big part to the employees wouldn't it be fair that they get compensated i mean it's 1200 bucks 500 bucks for for delivery employees yeah they should for a quarter and and they probably like the tesla should probably learn a lesson here and not give you know, straight make it or break it bonuses. They should give good point. You know, like bonuses based on how many each person sells, or you know, if if Tesla sets the record globally, where everybody's happy, then give the bonus out. Globally, give the bonus out if they don't hit the record and everybody's pissed off. But yeah. you know, here's a kind of a weird situation where they blew by their record, yet. The employees don't get the bonus. Do you think there's any chance that the on purpose set the goal a little bit too high, and then they might have changed some logistical thing for the last 200 cars? Do you I, subscribe to that idea? I would hope not, but I had heard that uh, point uh, mentioned a few times before even the quarter ended. Uh, yeah, I did too. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I did too. Not. I don't think so because I, I think like every car makes a big difference for Tesla. So if they could have, they would have. I do think that the goal was extremely ambitious, which is why I think they should get their bonuses because the fact that they came so close is impressive on its own. Um, yeah, those people are all passionate about the mission. They just got their salary cut. You just had the blowout quarter. Just pay the people. Pay them. Uh, of course, now, well, I said I don't like the, re the, the the response from a lot of Tesla fans who are, are, are saying that uh, Tesla is doing the right thing and paying them because he didn't reach a call. Uh, some of them, for just posting this news that I got from several reliable sources within Tesla, called me telling a, a short for posting that. Again, I'm surprised I need to restate that, but I am long Tesla. And it's I'm not about longer. being, and Seth is also a lot longer Tesla than I am. I'm not a lot longer, uh, but I'm a lot more. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I honestly, I have no idea what you're at, but I know I I put a lot in. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, it's a fraction of what you have. Uh, but it's not about being long or short Tesla. It's just about doing the right thing here for for the employees. It, it shouldn't be people are accusing each other of being long or short. Doesn't really matter at this point. There's no doubt that Tesla had an incredible quarter. There's no doubt that it's a big part of it is due to the employees uh, working extremely hard. Should get compensated for it. That's it. That's it. Uh, yeah. So what we were talking earlier about Elon saying something weird and then retracting it and then um, is stopping sending cars once they reach uh, full cell driving. This plays into the whole. Um, appreciating asset thing that Elon has been pushing for the last few months that uh, it makes no sense to buy a new car right now if it's not a Tesla vehicle because of the the will eventually enable full self-driving capability of it and uh, it, it makes sense to a degree if the um, they increase the price 
of the car once the full self-driving happened. So at first, Elon uh, was asked, do consumers have limited time left to buy a Tesla car since price would have to go up several fold to balance supplies and demands once you sold the LSD? Elon said yes. And then he clarified that, where's the clarification? Okay, here. Yeah, um, yeah, consumer will be able to buy a Tesla, but clearing price will rise significantly as a fully autonomous car that can function as a robot testing several times more variable than a non-autonomous car. So he, he's being estimating $30,000 uh, $30, in revenue a year. So the price of acquisition would match the revenue generating part of the asset, which makes sense. But what it means is that a consumer, like Tesla will not sell cars at the consumer price anymore. Like what we're used to right now, between forty thousand dollars and a uh, hundred thousand dollars, but they do sell some cars that are over a hundred thousand dollars. But let's take the Model Three between forty thousand and uh, uh, what goes up to fifty-five, I think, six sixty, maybe, maybe even for the uh, performance version, fully equipped. That won't be the case anymore because uh, it, it would generate so much money per year if you um, put your car on the Tesla network, the Robo Taxi service. It would generate so much money that it, it wouldn't uh, make sense to sell the cars at those price. So, uh, what do you think, Seth? Is it just another like uh, pulling the trigger, like a demon, uh, a demon lever, or something? Uh, so, two things. One, you know, to unpack, uh, Elon. I think a little quick on the trigger on the yes thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, thankfully, it wasn't during trading hours. Um, and I, I think that might be why he's tweeting more late at night because I think he's not supposed to be tweeting during, you know, when the stock is actively being traded. But so the guy I asked, do consumers have a limited time left to buy a Tesla car? Mm -hmm. That was the question. And Elon says, yes, that clearly mm -hmm. indicates that, you know, consumers aren't going to be able to buy the car at some point. Then mm -hmm. the clarification, which was probably based on uh, Jamie's post, um, was that to be clear, consumers will be able to buy a Tesla, but the clearing price will be rise significantly. So, you know, if a car is making and, you know, theoretically, then it's worth, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? And why would you sell a car for fifty thousand dollars when you can get it, you know, for hundreds of thousands of dollars for the car? So that that's the rationale. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's thinking a little too far ahead. Like, I, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> like, no, Elon, you know, no, yeah, a little bit. Um, so a couple things. One is, uh, you know, it's not a zero sum game. Like you're still going to need people to buy like regular or there's, there's going to be a need for regular cars. Um, also like Ubers, you know, they get trashed pretty easily. There's not, there's a lot of an equation to be added to that. So I don't think it's been totally thought out perfectly yet. And I also don't know if his timeline on when um, he's going to be able to to sell robo taxis is going to be accurate. Yeah, and uh, while we were talking about that, let, let, let's quickly mention um, what happened with uh, Tesla Autopilot team in the last few months. We previously reported on uh, the restructuring of the Autopilot software team um, after the investor day in April, and saying that the, that Elon sort of like took over the team and he, he changed the responsibility of a bunch of them employees, including Stuart Bowers, was in charge of software. And uh, there was a follow-up report this week about um, from the information that Bolt on a report that uh, came out in May uh, that listed uh, clearly like uh, uh, more employees that left and uh, responsibility that changed. And they state that 10% uh, of the team actually left uh, as part of that restructuring, uh, whether they quit or uh, were pushed out. and. Um, they list a bunch you can see on electric we put the, the whole list on but it, it is a significant restructuring that saw our understanding is that 
they pushed out or people left that were not on board with Elon's timeline. Elon seems either very confident about a timeline or he wants people that do believe in it so that there's a chance of achieving it. Of course, the timeline is, again, full self-driving by the end of next year in terms of capabilities and then whatever it takes to convince the regulators to uh, to approve it in different markets, which can, you know, who knows. Um, but yeah, so now um, we previously reported on, on Milan Kovac that uh, is now in charge of... Uh, it seems to be in charge of software reporting directly to Elon and Drew Baglino, a VP of engineering, who has a bunch of different responsibility, took over pet planning from a guy that left, uh, uh, Frank Havlak. Uh, just a, another quick one, like um, the simulation team. So the Tesla, uh, one of Tesla's big inventors, of course, with the pilot, is that there's hardware, software in the cars right now, hundreds of thousands of cars all around the world that sends back data very um, valuable data for Tesla to uh, put into their machine learning system and improve uh, autopilot toward the goal of being a full self-driving system. But they also have a simulation system that they develop for other corner cases that they try to uh, teach autopilot to handle. And Ben Goldstein was in charge of that. Now he accepted a similar position at uh, GM Cruise, GM's uh, Cruise, which is now a GM division. Um, uh, no, no, uh, CG Moore is now in charge of that. And um, Tesla very much promoted from within the company, which has been a trend lately. A bunch of like five years and more uh, veteran of uh, the autopilot team have been promoted, except from Kojak, who's uh, Ko Kovac, who's uh, uh, I've been there for three years, I think. So, uh, still a long time for, for Tesla, <laughs> I'd argue. But yeah. Another thing that Elon uh, tweeted this week was the Model S and X refresh that uh, we expect is coming by the end of the year. Elon said, and I quote, there is no refresh Model X or Model S coming, only a series of minor ongoing changes. Most significant changes in the past few years was to use high efficiency Model 3 rear drive units as S and X front drive units. That went into production three months ago. We reported on that, of course, uh, when it happened. Uh, was it three months ago? Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Three months ago, yeah. Um, there was also a suspension upgrade. Again, we did a few other changes. Uh, some people would call that a refresh, uh, not Elon. And I think that comment is important in that context where Elon just very much doesn't like the word refresh uh, and very focuses on Tesla as incremental improvement, which I think it, 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 it's fair. Like Tesla does, unlike any other automaker, introduce incremental improvement in its car consistently. It doesn't wait for a model year change or a specific refresh. However, hmm. they have bundled a bunch of changes before. We remember some exterior changes and then battery pack changes in, uh, during the uh, second quarter of 2016, the new front end, a few different exterior changes during that time too. At the same time, if most people will call that a refresh. Most other auto makers will call it some refresh. A refresh is not a full new model, a full new different model. It's a refresh of an existing model. It's a new take, a few different changes. Um, the changing a front motor, changing a suspension, and a few other uh, things that ch were changed uh, in the last update, a lot of people call it a refresh too. So I would keep that in mind when Elon says there's no refresh coming. Yeah, and I mean, I think even the the biggest uh, Elon fanatic would kind of agree that the front fascia change the Model S is kind mm -hmm. of like, you can kind of tell that was the old model and that's the new model. Like yeah. that in particular that that one thing if nothing else and and the, you could argue a bunch of other stuff but that one thing that changed the front you could like you in a second you can tell that car versus the older car um and i think pretty much everybody agrees that that's a refresh yeah. the other thing you have to keep in mind is that elon would never 
comment on an upcoming hardware upgrade basically that's coming relatively soon because it would kill the sales of, of the car also so he only comments about uh, software features or long-term improvement in batteries and things like that he doesn't comment on upcoming uh, hardware changes um he did say no revamped interior coming but well, again that, that's all semantic at this point like what does he mean by revamp what does he consider revamp anymore if he doesn't consider what we s discussed before refresh so uh, we don't know. Uh, of course, that that uh, plays into what we uh, reported last year about the upcoming interior refresh, and we posted a bunch of pictures of that of the early drawer design drawings of it. That all came from a very reliable source at uh, Tesla that is still available to this day, and we still post important news from it on this day. Uh, so we're still very confident about that. At least it, that at least it was the plan at the time. But the, that that we posted that a year ago, and. They said it was coming a year from now. So, of course, things can change over the course of a year. And especially with, with what happened Tesla during the first quarter with the cash crunch and everything, that might have uh, pushed the plans a little. Um, like That's very likely. Uh, and also, in line with Elon's comments about incremental improvements over um, bundling the improvements, they might introduce like just the, uh, uh, the horizontal screen first, uh, things like that, and wait maybe for the fan like design of uh like the model three but there's other things that needs to come for sure that we were talking about tesla testing uh the 2177 a new batch pack ar architecture based on the 2170 cells of the model didn't three elon in model say, s didn't elon specifically say that that the model s and x would not get the 2170 cells he said that like years ago really so <laughs> i'm not sure like again things change and Model S and X need uh, to be able to charge at the same speed on Model Three or higher. Yeah. They're just, they're yeah, just they, they, oh, again, brings me to another thing that I don't like about Tesla fans. They're accusing me of killing Model S and X cells by uh, claiming that Tesla is going to upgrade them. Um, sure, is that really what affects the cells more, or the fact that? the need to upgrade them to match the Model 3 capabilities. I think that's the bigger killer for cells, the Model S and X, that the Model 3 is just better right now with faster charging. It's so, it's so much better in so many ways that I, I can't for the life of me figure out why anybody would buy Model S right now. Um, <laughs> it's just bigger, I guess. But It's bigger, but like not much. And it, a bit know, longer like, range for the, the long range version too a now. A little but, bit. Like, yeah. come on. It's it's really like the Model Three is such a better car, yeah, than the Model S. It's yeah. Just also, uh, to that argument, I reported that starting last year in July, and the cells really started just to be affected earlier this year, matching Tesla's announcement of the supercharger V3 only being compatible with Model Three, at least the charging rate of the supercharger V3 only being compatible with Model Three. So, there's no doubt that that's what affecting the cells that the Model. S and X is now on par with Model 3 in terms of battery capacity right now. Not the fact that I'm saying that it's going to be, which I think is obvious to everyone that Tesla is going to update its flagship lineup models uh, with the latest capabilities. Uh, now, whether it, Tesla is going to do it with, uh, as we previously reported, that they've been testing the, the 2170 architecture on Model S and X, or are they going to wait for the Maxwell technology that uh, they're supposed to bring to production and talk about at the investor powertrain and battery event later this year. I don't know. That's a real possibility. Is it that that's pushing the old timeline? Maybe. Uh, I think that would make sense. Again, we're putting information out there. You guys do wh wh what you want with it, but uh, blaming me for sales dropping when uh, clearly uh, there's other factors at play. I mean, I, it's definitely a factor. But the, the, not the Model company. 3 also was only on sale in the US for such a long time that the Model S and X were still selling in, in uh, Europe and China. Um, so Good it point, wasn't yeah. like it wasn't like an immediate tail off. I would like to see the numbers in the US <clears throat> of the Model S and X and when they really dropped off quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I said that I've been saying this for a year and more than a year. Yeah. Like you've been saying before the a, supercharger V2 came out that uh, I, I basically said it when they gave us a, a ride in the Model 3 at that Model 3 launch event. Like, there's no way that this isn't gonna cannibalize the Model S. And you want like and it took a while for for you to be proven through, but uh, eventually you were.
Right, but I mean, Tesla wants that to happen. Like, yeah. you want to cannibalize your own. You don't want somebody else doing it. Exactly. So they probably aren't making as much on the sale of a Model 3 as a Model S, though. So that's that's kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. But they can figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, Model 3 is such a great car. And it's it's the best road trip car, which is what I reported this week based on my... I mean, what a segue, right? Uh yeah. I took a, I rented a Model 3 on Thoreau. They said, what do you say? Well, why do you do that, Fred? You have a Model 3. Yeah, but I, I'm in Los Angeles right now. I don't have a Model 3. My Model 3 is in uh, good ends right now with my good friend Matt uh, in Quebec. So uh, we were debating, should we, uh, we were going, we wanted to go to Vegas for the long weekend, me and my girlfriend, uh, for a bunch of, a bunch of like, cool activity that we had planned. But we were debating, should we fly there or should we uh, drive there? And I, I, I was thinking, if we drive there, I kind of want a Tesla because it's going to be a lot of driving. Um, technically, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, it's like a four-hour trip. But with the long weekend, we knew it was going to be a ton of traffic, especially coming back because all everyone is trying to come back on Sunday. Um, Sometimes it can take 10 hours to do that four-hour drive. So I wanted... To be uh, to have the autopilot. If we hit stop and go traffic, I think autopilot is just uh, wonderful and stop and go traffic. Uh, so I rented a Model Three on Thoreau, which uh, my first time using Thoreau was great service, very easy. Picked up the car in Santa Monica and uh, set out there. It was a long range, long range Model Three uh, rear wheel drive, uh, which is of course 210, 225, uh, depending. Uh, uh, on on the range that is uh, listed, already 210. Tesla said that they upgraded it to 225 in a software update, but not everyone has been seeing 225 on a full charge. Um, the car wasn't fully charged when I when I picked it up. The uh, owner said that uh, his excuse for it was that he only charged on the supercharger network. And the one in Santa Monica was locked to 80%, which is, of course, something we reported way back a few months ago. Tesla locked some of the supercharger to 80%. But you can override that, as we explained, if you just <laughs> swipe the uh, battery charge limit. So he didn't know that, but now he knows. Um, but we had over 200 miles of range, which was plenty, because the route between Las Vegas and LA is one of the most well-covered routes by a supercharger. There's six different supercharger when you exit the greater LA area uh, through uh, Las Vegas, six supercharger on that route. So it wasn't any shot at all. And we, with a full charge, you can actually get there in one charge. Uh, it's limit. Uh, maybe you don't drive too fast, but you don't want to get there anyway in one, in one drive because it's, it's four hours. You, you want to stop to heat or to go to the restroom at some point, uh, which is what we did. And what was great about that trip is overall, we ended up driving 10 hours going there, coming back. And we really didn't wait for charging a minute. Because going there, uh, we stopped. We actually, actually stopped twice because we ended up needing to go to the restroom just when we weren't supercharged. So we stopped for 15 minutes charge. And we're getting low on charge there. So we got to 143 kilowatts in just two minutes. And we ended up in the 15 minutes hiding over 100 miles of range. And then from that was in the Yermo supercharger, which is just outside of Barstow. And then we ended up driving to Baker's because uh, we started to get hungry. We figured like we we probably get hungry in forty minutes by the time we we hit Baker. Sure enough, uh, we started to get hungry, but uh, we had to stop anyway because we ran into a, a little snafu here. It's right before the exit uh, of the supercharger in Baker, we hit uh, an exploded truck tire on the road. So I was on autopilot, but I don't think autopilot had any uh, impact in in that. Um, in that situation, because I had my hands on the wheel. I was uh, very attentive looking ahead. I actually saw two cars ahead. There was a pickup truck. Pickup truck did the weird move. So I'm like, oh, what's going on? So I was already alert that there was something going on, but I didn't see exactly what was happening. And the car in front of me ended up running right over the, the, the tire and ended up like moving around uh, on the tire. So I saw, OK, that, that's when I saw, but I had only like a second and a half to react. And I just looked around me, and we were going 65 miles per hour, but it was still heavy traffic around us. We we're just like going quite um, 
at, at, at a decent speed within the traffic. And there was a car right behind me, car next to me. I'm like, I wasn't comfortable doing anything. So we just ran over the tire. And the impact was surprising. It was like a, a semi truck tire that it was exploded. So it wasn't as hard. It was a little bit flexible, but it's still a lot of rubber uh, that you hit at, at that speed. I thought. Uh, I thought that the bumper would be falling off really at the speed we hit, and the whole car lifted in the air when we ran over it. So I, I thought it was going to be pretty bad. Uh, we, of course, we exited right away. We were like 500 feet from the from the exit. It was insane. Uh, we get to the supercharger. We stop. Surprisingly, uh, not that much damage on the bumper. Really, just a, a, a scratch, though, though a pretty significantly deep scratch. So that's definitely uh, an issue, but. I thought the bumper would be falling off, really, so that not that bad. And it, uh, the impact underneath the car ended up removing uh, the underbody panel from the front lip of the car, which is pretty bad because all the air ended up getting into the underbody panel uh, because it um, unscrewed a bunch of plastic screws underneath the car. And uh, there's also another underbody panel behind that main panel, which is like a felt-like panel. This one also lost a screw. So it was it was flapping around, which wasn't that bad really, because uh, air gets underneath that panel anyway. Uh, it, it's just that if it's flapping around, it, it does hit uh, the um, efficiency, the aerodynamic of the of the vehicle for sure. But uh, we managed to tape that up at least. Uh, we just bought like a aluminum foil tape tape uh, at the truck stop next to the supercharger, and we taped. Oh, I see we but. Maybe my girlfriend Francis because she's small enough to actually get underneath the car, <laughs> so she taped that up, and we both managed uh, by uh, together by forcing the uh, the plastic underbody panel. We put it right back in the lip, so the body panel was still the main one was still perfectly inside. So that was good. So we we, we ended up just sitting back right back on the trip uh, without too much issue. So that that was good on that part. It's just that there's definitely some damage of the car, which uh, we we made a claim with with, with thorough. Uh, the owner of the Malfi, of course, was wasn't happy about his car being damaged, but he was understanding that there wasn't much I was able, I, I could have done to not hit that tire. And uh, we just made a claim with the insurance and we'll see what the, what they say. But so, uh, let me get this straight. Uh, you hit a tire at highway speeds. That's the same thing that causes those Tesla fires about sometimes, five, yeah. year, five years ago. And then you sent your girlfriend underneath the car to fix it. <laughs> I was at that point. I was very confident that that everything was okay. Like the car wasn't sending any uh, alert error. It was still driving very well. So I wasn't. I was very confident that uh, I wasn't throwing her uh, in the fire. Throwing throwing her under the Tesla. Uh, under the Tesla fire, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we plugged the car, the supercharger. That we didn't even really need to charge at this point. We could have made it ready to Vegas, but we we, we were um, again hungry, so uh, and we needed to stop anyway because of the, uh, to fix that thing. So I mean, I should, so you could argue, oh yeah, that's why you didn't wait for charging. You were repairing your car at the same time. If we like, we we took maybe ten more minutes uh, than we were to just stop to eat. We still wouldn't have waited at, at all uh, either way. Anyway, we made it to Vegas. We stayed at the Bellagio, which happens to have a destination charger. So we charged overnight there. Again, no waiting. And we had a full charge to uh, to come back. Coming back, especially coming back, you are downhill a little bit more. Uh, you We could have easily made it uh, to um, to LA without even charging, which would have been great, just because the Model 3 is so efficient. However, it was looking like a six, seven hours drive from the traffic. so. We're like, nah, we're not. We're gonna have to stop anyway if we on the road for six hours. And what we ended up doing instead, we needed to charge. We actually do need it to charge because we tried to go around the traffic and go into uh, further down into the desert, uh, which we, which was added maybe like fifty miles or so to to the the trip. So we needed to charge a little bit, which we did. End up stopping at Barstow and uh, hitting at the Chili's there. Uh, because of the heavy traffic, I thought that maybe we're gonna have to uh, wait for f to even get a spot to charge the bar. So, and sure enough, when we arrived there, uh, this, it was 16, 16 stalls, and they were all occupied. But just as we pulled in, some people were leaving, so we just took their spot. And by the time we came out of the chili, the the, uh, the car was already charged to ninety percent, which was more than enough to get back to LA uh, by a long shot. Funny story: while we were in, just after we arrived. Uh, 
at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. If you guys don't know, there's been there've been a bunch of uh, earthquakes here in Southern California, and uh, actually closer to Nevada, really, because uh, we experienced the first one in LA, and it wasn't that bad at all. But it, when you're in Las Vegas, you're actually closer to the epicenter of the um, uh, of the earthquake, where it's that uh, Ridge Crest, which is like a little uh, east of uh, Bakersfield, and we were on the 26th floor of the the tower, um, the Bellagio. And uh, if you know anything about tower engineering, they make it so that the tower actually swings when there's an earthquake uh, to avoid damages. I understand. So we experienced that 7.1 earthquake from the our room <laughs> there, and it was swinging so much that we honestly thought that the whole building was going to collapse. And that was right after, like a few hours after hitting that tire, which we already like got a big boost, a big dose of uh, adrenaline. And then a second time with that earthquake, which we ended up running down the 26 floors of uh, of the tower. The stairway? From on the stairs, because of course, you, you think the building's going to collapse, you're not going to get in the right. elevator. So we run down those stairs with a bunch of other people that, was all, that were also panicking on the 26th floor. And then we get downstairs at uh, uh, at the the main casino floor, and everybody's like, "What? Why are you guys so sweaty? Why are you guys so panicking?" Because at the ground level, you don't feel it that much. I mean, you do feel like you, you see things uh, shaking around you, but you don't. It's nothing like feeling like we were at the window when when it happened because we were looking at the fountains of the Bellagio, so we we're looking at the nice spectacle of it. So we were right next to the window. So when the building actually started swinging, we are leaning towards so you can you can see like the whole entire building which you're not supposed to see uh so it is it was really panicking but we ended up just <laughs> uh, relaxing for a few seconds downstairs and then they go all right i guess everyone is like we we were going to see the Cirque du Soleil. I, when i was running downstairs i was thinking oh shit, they're gonna cancel the Cirque du Soleil. Now. i'm not gonna see the show but whatever downstairs like nope i think it's just us was panicking for nothing but yeah it was it was a fun trip and uh mold three definitely made it a, a lot uh, more fun a lot smoother and those 10 hours of driving was mostly all on autopilot i mean i love autopilot i use it all the time i always stay hands on the wheel looking ahead but it does remove a lot of the stress especially the and stop and go traffic the traffic away school control is very good uh over those 10 hours i did probably around 10 intervention where uh especially like in construction zone or where there's a um, like a, a cement wall on the very close to the side of uh, of the road like the sometimes the autopilot gets a little bit too close and i don't think it was going to hit it but i was not comfortable with it so i i took over but um very very good performance nonetheless i mean 10 hours 10 uh intervention i think it's pretty good for now but of course it needs to get a lot better to uh achieve full self-driving i also use the navigate on autopilot uh for part of the trip, but I, I still think sometimes it suggests some lane changes that make no sense. It, it makes it, it makes no sense, but it, it should make sense in a perfect world where people actually drive correctly, where people use the left lane to pass, which of course in the US no one does. Like people, left lane is just a left lane. The right lane is a right lane for some reason, and uh, it doesn't it's matter crazy. how fast you do. I hate it. Yeah. I, I mean, that was the first thing they teach you uh, in driving school in Quebec. It was like, yeah. left lane is for passing. Get out I of love, the left lane if you're not passing. I love going to places where people actually understand that. And it's yeah, yeah it's so much nicer to drive there. So much nicer. So you end up having to pass on the right lane a bunch of times and everything. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to you to leave a, a lane or not. So the autopilot... autopilot needs to predict how bad people are drivers, really. That's what it needs to get good at. Which is probably a tough thing to program, really. Uh, boy. All right. Chademo adapter now compatible for Model Three. I know we reported that before, but it was a bunch of false start with Tesla actually listing them as compatible, and then we're like, no, nope, sorry, our bad. It's actually not. This time, Tesla bringing back on the list of compatible compatible adapters. And they confirmed to us that uh, this time they didn't uh, mess up. It's it, it actually is compatible. Not only it is compatible, but it's also um, 
uh, backward compatible, meaning that if you have one right now, if you bought one for like a Model S or X or something, and you want to use it on Model 3, it's going to work if your Model 3 is on the 2019.24.1 software update compatible with that. When did um, that update start, start rolling out? The 25th, 24th week of <laughs> of the year. I don't know where that was. <laughs> it's like halfway through the year. Yeah. So, uh, like, a, like last month or something, like a few weeks ago. Right. So theoretically, it should work for most people. That's a shame. Yeah. I should have, because I have one of those. I should have tried that. Uh, I should have been trying it. Uh, it's funny, the place where near us that is a Chatamo site uh, actually just got like 10 Tesla superchargers. Even going there now would be pointless for me. Yeah, that 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 was my take on it in the article. Like, it is uh, it it is going to be great news for a few owners who live in like uh, I mean I I got one too when I I, I had my Model S. Well, I still have my Model S, but my parents are using it, um, and I used it twice. Four hundred and fifty dollars for for twice. I think my parents might have used it a few times. I'm not one hundred percent sure on that. So maybe it got a little bit more money out of it. Uh, but there are definitely like I got me messages from when I wrote that from people like in Quebec who are, who are often driving to Gaspésie or to ABCB or things like that. And for those people, that, that makes a big difference because there's just no supercharger there yet. I mean, there's one in the Rimouski, so you can probably get to Gaspésie and then charge on a destination there and come back. I don't know what any. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, Gaspésie is the tip of um, uh, the eastern tip of uh, of Quebec. Um, and it's not a very uh, populated area, yeah. so there's no supercharger. But it is a somewhat popular route for tourism because uh, have you ever heard of the uh, Rocher Percé, the uh, rock, uh, like a big rock in the ocean uh, with a, a hole in it, like a giant rock, and you can get a boat inside it. Oh, interesting. You've probably yeah. seen the picture before. You just don't know, don't know the by name, but that's where it it is. So. Uh, so for a bunch of people like that, it would make sense. But for the most part, you, you want to use a supercharger. It's just more convenient. It's just cheaper. So, uh, and what about the CCS charger? I think most more people would have liked the CCS charger, especially uh, adapter, I should say. Yeah, especially if you can go over 50 kilowatt. Exactly, because that thing is still limited to 50. So. But again, if you want one, 450 bucks. Not cheap. I kind of feel like I I wish I could donate mine to like a local CCS or a, a local Chatamo. Uh, I know place. Fastnet does that. Uh, well, they not donate, but they they keep it at the charger. You, that, right. Is that what you mean? Yeah, they yeah. put a train on it and then you, you stay at the charger. That makes a lot of sense because you just need one per charger. You don't need one per per person really. Yeah, maybe I'll see about doing that in uh, Vermont, where it's pretty much the only place we'll ever use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, Tesla will suggest travel destination within the in-car uh, navigation system, said Elon's. Um, that's nice. That, that was actually a suggestion from an owner on Twitter. That's always nice when Elon actually takes suggestions like that and then says that he will implement them. Uh, someone suggested that I'm feeling lucky destination where it's, it would be an option in the navigation system. You click I'm feeling lucky and then it suggests you a destination based on uh, recommendation from other test owners or directly like where test owners in the area are driving and Elon said that would be a good idea and then later on I uh, actually said done we, we gotta do it he's gonna do it my feeling lucky destination and I'm feeling hungry destination where I assume that's will be a local restaurant recommendation from owners um that sounds like fun that sounds like some kind of trip advisor like competitor by yeah, it'll powered be, it'll by the community I wonder how I wonder how it'll work. I wonder what the logic will be. Uh, like, yeah, I don't know if it's good. It's is it going to be like you submit your information to Tesla, or they just take your information? Like, hey, there's a bunch of Tesla drivers that like the in and out, you know, down the road. <laughs> so let's take them there. Or is yeah. it going to be like they ask you, hey, can we use your restaurant? Suggest you know where you end up mm -hmm. eating dinner. Yeah. So. It'll be you already accept to, to share your data a lot with Tesla. I think so. You might it might actually yeah. be uh, so someone on the electric article that we wrote uh, posted the uh, uh, why am I always being suggested to go to the strip club? <laughs> You're gonna <laughs> might get some weird suggestion too. Be interesting. Um, 
Yeah, and at the same time, Elon also hinted that uh, Spotify is finally coming to test a vehicle in North America. Our friends in Europe, or Tesla owner finally. friends in Europe, are already having Spotify, but for years now, really, um, never made it to North America. We don't know exactly for sure, but it sounds like it might be a contractual uh, situation because we have Slacker in North America as a streaming service within Tesla cars. Uh, so we think Tesla might have a contract with them that they can broke yet. Um, if you look actually at the parent company of Slacker, Tesla's fleet is like 30, 40% of their revenues. <laughs> so if uh, Tesla doesn't use Slacker anymore, it might be like uh, bankruptcy for them or something. Like uh, it yeah, might be that big of a deal. So deal. It, it's a different, difficult situation to navigate for Tesla. But uh, a Tesla owner again asked on, on Twitter and Elon said, okay. So that's not like a very extensive uh, answer, but it looks like uh, he's actually agreeing that Spotify should come to Tesla's fleet in uh, North America. And theoretically, they're working on it behind the scenes. I mean, it doesn't seem like they, it would be they have hard. been doing it for a while. We've seen it in the North American software. Uh, push that uh, all the framework was there for, for for Spotify. They just never turned that to the turn it on for the fleet. So the works should actually already be there. They just need to turn it on. I think, uh, which they, they cannot do. They have to put a license with uh, with, with Spotify to do it. Tesla was also supposed to have its own uh, streaming service at some point. Elon was talking about that, and we saw it in the software too at that time. But uh, they never i think they put that project on the back burner like it's not a priority really and also last month elon said that they were working on a fun little music tool coming later and the tweak to the music app inside the vehicle so that might be it though i wouldn't call it a tweak well the, mu the music app inside tesla car is more than just streaming there's there's the radio there's the tune in there's a bunch of other stuff but Streaming is a big part. I actually don't mind Slacker that much. Uh, I think it's pretty good. Uh, if I really want to use Spotify, I just stream it via Bluetooth on my phone. So it's not that big of a deal. But yeah, I, I do see how more, it would definitely be more convenient if it's uh, integrated in the system. So I think a lot of people have been asking for that too. I hate, I hate to be the one to say this, but I really like Android Auto and CarPlay. I kind of wish Tesla would at least have that as an option. Yeah, it's really nice yeah, it to be, be able nice. to get your get your tunes on the on the thing that you have in your pocket anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people are still asking for that, but I somehow no, I doubt it that Tesla yeah, will make it like a it. priority. They're really pushing their also, own. What line. happened? I thought Tesla was going to do their own streaming music service. Yeah, yeah, we just mentioned that. That looks like it hit the back burner to the project, not priority. Yeah. All right, uh, BMW finally officially unveiled the Mini Cooper Electric, Mini Ooh. Cooper SE, and uh, it comes with 168 miles of range. And as we previously reported, it is based on the BMW i3 powertrain, uh, actually even a little older version of the current one. And um, we don't have the price yet, but unless it's uh, low, I mean, very low uh it's not really appealing right i think uh you were very disappointed said yeah so it it's particularly frustrating i mean it it's basically like the honda e in the specs like it's a car that can charge very fast basically you know pre-2016 kind of specs um but what's particularly frustrating about it is that 10 years ago bmw had a mini e uh it was it was a limited release. Jamie had one. Um, it wasn't like a full production run, but it was a car that people were driving. Um, I mean, this is pre model S, you know, this is like in the roadster days. Mm -hmm. Um, they had a car and, a, you know, I, I don't remember the exact specs. So I, I jumped onto Wikipedia and they had the mini E that had a 150 kilowatt motor. So that's 200 horsepower. And a 35 kilowatt battery, which is crazy. Like in 10 years, they've gone from, they've gone backwards. They get, they have a slower motor and a, a smaller battery. And of course, you know, that, that was kind of a hack. So they only kind of rated that at a hundred miles of range. And this one, 
Um, the title is a little, a little bit misleading on this one because, I mean, BMW says 168 mile range, but that's the uh, which WLTP. One? The one, but it's actually the worst. It's actually the NEDC. No, they, they can't. They can't do it NEDC. Well, so is it? So they did. They said for 146 to 168 miles based on the WLTP cycle. Um, but anyway, the real world is going to be 140 miles or so, which is, you know, Honda E territory. But again, disappointing on all fronts. It charges at 50 kil kilowatts. So basically the same as uh, the i3 or the, the Chevy Bolt, um, actually less than the Chevy Bolt. So just kind of it's like hard to be enthusiastic about it, even though finally there's an electric mini E out again. Um, man, yeah, I tend just like I tend to agree with you, except if they come up with a great price, right? Because it, you're right; like it, it should be a lot bigger, lot more attractive specs than that. However, if you just accept the fact that it is a city vehicle, it's not a long range car, it's not for road trip, anything like that, it's for for city driving. Um. If the price is uh, like uh, closer to twenty eight, uh, even then, like I mean, the Nissan Leaf is pretty cool with that. But let's say if it's twenty seven thousand dollars, twenty eight thousand um, dollars, then it get, becomes attractive. I don't think it's going to be that low. I think. Yeah, I doubt it either. But I, I, they, they're going to bank on the seventy five thousand dollars, a seventy five hundred dollars um, tax credit. Tax yeah. credit. And uh, they're gonna price it with that in mind. Put it at like thirty-five or something, and then you're gonna be able to get it for twenty-eight thousand. But maybe yeah. at twenty-five, if you have in a state like California, right? And here's the other thing: like, okay, the battery and the motor are both like not exciting. But if it's gonna be a city car, and and the battery and the motor are fine for city car, like they're gonna be, you know, nobody's gonna be too thrilled about it. But it's gonna work out just fine. You got to make the charging faster, like 50 kilowatts. Yeah. Because city people, they're parking on the side of the road. They're all, they're going to the in this case a CCS combo charger, like a gas station. They're not going to be able to charge overnight if they're true city people and they're parking on the side of the road or at, in a parking garage. So, with this thing, you're going to be stuck at a at a charger for mm -hmm. you know hours because it charges at 50 kilowatts, and that's you know optimistic. Um, and that's only to get 140 miles of range. So you're going to be doing that a few times a week or, you know, depending on your driving, you're going to be doing it quite often because you don't have that big range and you don't have the fast charging. So kind of disappointed all around. I don't know what I was expecting. Like, I, I guess I was hoping for at least a, like a speedy one. Like it, it doesn't seem like it would be a big, a lot of trouble to put a better uh, motor in there. I mean, at least beat a Nissan Leaf. Come on. Like you're gonna charge a premium. Yeah. It's a BMW. Get it in front of a, B a Nissan Leaf. But I, I wasn't uh, that surprised because like yeah, we 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 knew that it, w it wouldn't be the fifth generation because uh, of course BMW now is working on the fifth generation electric uh, powertrain technology, and uh, where they have a new battery pack architecture that allows for more power, more more energy density, and uh, they have a new motor um, architecture too that it's smaller and pack more power, uh, but that. That's only starting next year, and the first car is going to be BMW iX3. They uh, they just kept with the BMW i3 technology for this one, and uh, yeah, it is uh, it, I, such a great package, like a great format to electrify to the mini uh, segment. I mean, it's really the three door segment. Uh, yeah, and, and like, you said, like you said, it's not even the brand new i3 with the forty yeah. kilowatt hour battery. They're using an older i3, which also the the i3 is also faster zero to sixty than this car, even with the same yeah. hardware. More. So, yeah, yeah, I feel like they could have done better for sure. It's and... it's probably, probably going to sell okay just because of the looks. You know, I know yeah. a lot of people just love the way it looks. So yeah, Mini Coopers are popular. There. Yeah, so popular for the looks. Again, if the price is good, I might I might change my mind, but uh, let's I, I'm not keeping my hopes too too high for that.
All right, that's pretty much it for us this week, guys. Thanks a lot for watching, thanks for listening. Um, felt good to do it on Wednesday. We'll, we'll see if we keep going, but I think so. Uh, if you have any feedback on that, on the state, let us know. Uh, we'll always wait to listen. We might change. Uh, I'm going back to Montreal next week, too. So uh, I'm going back to a regular uh, my studio, if you want to call it, uh, with a little better audio and video quality. And uh, we're also working on that. Uh, we're going to change some of our. Uh, system because our current way to broadcast to you guys is google hangouts which google is apparently killing uh, yep and uh we're gonna have to change that so we're gonna see what do if you have suggestions for that to uh, let us know because we are exploring a few things right now but there's so many options that we're kind of lost in all in all but uh yeah that's me that's it have a good one bye bye